discussant for the talk. So how we're going to run the session is I'll first give a brief uh, introduction. We'll then play the video of Bruce Pascoe, which runs for about half an hour. And I'll then hand over to Tyson, who will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. And we'll have a sort of Q&A um, in that process. So, um, and as per usual, just, just remember to put your question in the polls in Pangea and state your name and where you're from if you'd like to personalize um, the question. So this keynote in many ways is not a keynote talk as, as usual. It's what we might think of, I guess, as a, a kind of deconstructed keynote. In the pre-COVID world, Bruce Pascoe was going to get in a very small plane and fly from northeastern Victoria to Melbourne, right down at the bottom of the state, and present to us in person. But when we realized he wouldn't be able to do that, we decided to take the conference to him. So filmmaker Kim Munro, film assistant and Dirk PhD candidate Kelly Chan and myself, and my toddler and partner, packed our bags and masks and traveled in convoy up to Malakuta, which is about 40 minutes from Bruce's farm uh, to, to film Bruce essentially on country. <clears throat> the serendipity of this, and we've all experienced many serendipities during COVID, is that we got to construct the kind of keynote that speaks to Bruce's own political, personal and philosophical ethos. A collective effort rather than a sage on the stage, as, you, as it were, with Bruce embedded in the place and the practices that so inform his critical writing and thinking. His farm, which is a literal experiment in regenerative indigenous agriculture, in recovering and scaling indigenous foods for Australian households, and also a living experiment in an ethical future of food, where land use is tied to collective ownership, spiritualism, culture, and the integral role of more than human actors, landscapes, plants, and animals. So before we go to the video, let me tell you a little bit about Bruce. A celebrated writer and thinker, Tasmanian and Ewan man Bruce Pascoe is the author of many acclaimed books and short story collections, as well as novels for young adults. Dark Emu, Bruce's groundbreaking book on Aboriginal agriculture, engineering and building practices has won numerous prizes. It's become a major bestseller and it's currently being filmed for television, as I, as I mentioned before. It also has a beer named after it. An eloquently written counterpoint to Australia's mythical historiographies in which Indigenous people are at best caricatured as hunter-gatherers or at worst erased from the landscape in the case of the colonial concept of terra nullius. Dark Emu is indeed a major tour de force. But as you'll see from the video that you're about to watch, Bruce is much more than a writer and critical thinker. Alongside his writing career, Bruce has also been a teacher. He's a farmer, fisherman, barman, fencing contractor, lecturer, Aboriginal language researcher, archeological site worker and editor, and most recently a firefighter. And in his spare time, he's also played 520 games of ordinary suburban and country football, and is still playing ordinary A-grade cricket today at the age of 73. Though I'm, get, I'm guessing you're realizing by now that there's nothing particularly ordinary about Bruce. Okay, so let's take that trip up to Northern Eastern uh, Victoria, right at the top of the state to Bruce Pascoe on his coastal farm.
on the farm, we're growing uh, kangaroo grass, um, microlina, uh, which is um, what we call dancing grass, mamadja nalo. Uh, we've also uh, got spear grass and um, a few other grasses. We harvest them all. We convert them into flour and make bread and um, pancakes and, you know, all sorts of other things can go in soups as well. Uh, it's gluten-free and highly nutritious. Uh, we're also growing murnong or a yam, but we, we're growing three, four varieties of murnong. We've got bulbine lily. We've got several other uh, tubers as well. Uh, all of those have been their traditional foods. We're growing them all and we use them um, in ceremony, but we're also hoping to, um, you know, use them commercially. That's why we're employing Aboriginal people here because we want our people to gain employment in this area. So the people we have here, occasionally their children come and work with us for a day or two, um, getting them used to the idea that this is a normal part of Aboriginal life as it used to be because these, all of these crops we've discovered by uh, excavation that they were all grown here. And it's unknown uh, because of the way Australian history is taught that our people were doing these things. So we're trying to impress on our young people, you know, don't believe the Australian history you teach in school, come here and learn your history. Have a look in this um, site that we've dug and look down at the profile of the soil and this will prove to you that Aboriginal people had open grasslands here and burnt those grasslands regularly. Now it's only in the last 250 years that this country has experienced wildfire and you can see that in the soil profile. So it's a really good example and we love taking the kids over there and saying, you know, you're looking at a profile here maybe 800 or 1,000 years um, have a look at that profile and you'll see that our people had control burn, control burn, control burns and then suddenly there's big pieces of carbon in the soil and that's forest fire. This is a bit of a thrill for us. This is SAM fire. We took cuttings um, down by the swamp and um, uh, put them in the, in the pot and we're getting a really good result out of that. We're learning more about this plant all the time, but um, in our salads and cooking fish and game, it's, um, it's a sensation. And th this is also a bit of a thrill for us. Um, we'd, we'd never grown warrigal greens before from seed, um, but we, um, we planted a whole couple of trays and we're getting a really good result. So we put five seeds in every, every pot and we're getting an average of one or two per, uh, per pot. Some of them have got three. So, you know, we, we, we now know that we can grow these from scratch. We've got a lot of murnong in here um, and outside. Um, that'll all go into the enclosed gardens. We're also growing a plant here. We don't even know what it's called, um, but it looked edible. So we tried it and it is, it be, has become, um, it's, a, it's a blandish flavor, but it's become the, the base, basis for, for our salads. So we can put the more um, flavorful and aromatic plants in with it, um, but it, you know, it's got no bitter aftertaste. It's a beautiful solid vegetable and, and it, it grows like a weed. You know, who would have thought it's an Australian plant grows like a weed, just loves this country. So we don't have to do anything. We just go and get it. A lot of the plants we have to put a bit of work into, but they all, all love it here. You know, the climate, we get frost here, we get hot sun. Sometimes there's not much water around and they'll all survive when other plants that you plant, like tomatoes and carrots, will suffer and die unless you pour the, the nutrients and the water into them. All of these ones, they just love it. 
they'll become the standard in the Australian backyard because people find that they're flavorful, incredibly nutritious and um, easy to grow. It'll be, you know, we'll move away gradually from potatoes and carrots and parsnips and we'll move into our own Australian cuisine. We've got a lot of um, Murnong in here and Bulbine Lily. All this is sown down to Murnong. Same for uh, the other bed there. All these beds have been constructed by Ewan people and um, they've got fruit trees in amongst them. Uh, some of them our trees, some of them conventional trees like lemons and pears and peaches. But uh, the, the aim is that this whole area will be covered in Monong and um, it's going to, going to be so thick we can just walk across it and uh, try and make our paths through it without destroying the, the plants but we'll be able to harvest commercial quantities out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm not modelling anything on the farm. I'm just repeating what happened here before. And, you know, on, on this veranda, you look around, you'll find things here, um, you know, stuff that we've made the old way, you know, coolamons. Over there, you'll find stones that have turned up on the property, which we've uncovered as we build. And we're looking after those, and they will eventually go back there. But we're not we're not inventing anything here. We're just um, repeating what has been done before because it worked. Because working on this land to slow down the water on the property as it used to be stops all the erosion drifting into the river and choking it up and blocking the entrance. Because the forestry and agricultural operations further upstream from here are destroying this river. And uh, even within living memory, you know, you could bring bigger boats up here than are coming here now. But siltation from bad agricultural forestry practice means it's impossible now. You know, we should be aware of that. And a, a farmer should be ashamed to see his soil entering the river. He should be ashamed because it's not necessary. You know, a farmer should be should be so proud of his soil and he doesn't want one skerrick of it to end up there. And the farmers up north of us and those who are, are ploughing their land for cotton and rice, they should be ashamed to see those giant dust storms. They're farmers of the soil. And to see their soil up in the air should alert them to the fact they're doing something wrong. Don't blame the bloody drought. There's no drought. You know, there's no flood. You know, it's, it's Australia. And if you plough the light Australian soils and see a dust storm, it is not drought that did it, it is you. You and your bloody tractor. Don't be proud of your tractor. I've got two, I love them to death because they're so useful to me. And I don't destroy the soil with it. This forest over here, people think, oh, how beautiful is that forest, you know. It's a really unnatural forest. It's been logged about eight times, and there are probably 200 trees to the acre. In the forest plantations uh, to the north uh, in New South Wales, there's probably 320 odd trees to the acre. That is a, a, a bush block that is going to not just burn, it's going to explode. The style of forestry operation is designed um, to be dangerous. You know, they want small trees for wood pulp, but to get it, you have to design a, a dangerous forest. And then we have, to, we have to pay for that. We pay for it twice. We pay for it because we're subsidising an unsustainable industry, and we pay for it when the thing explodes and burns our houses down. So we need to look at forestry in a completely different way. That forest should not 
be central to the Australian heart. That is an unnatural forest. What is central to the Australian heart is that one down there where we've got 10 trees for the acre, all mature trees. Those trees never caught a light. It burnt beneath them for three days, but they never caught a light because they're mature trees. Their branches are far off the ground and the litter beneath them, because of the deep shade, was of a completely different nature to the forestry operations of both Victoria and New South Wales. And foresters have to have a really good look at their operation. Uh, we need timber. Uh, we need it uh, to produce timber for houses and all sorts of other things, but we need to do it differently. And producing trees of that diameter simply to pulp them, unsustainable. And we're shipping that timber in boats to Japan and then buying it back as toilet paper. You know, it, it can't be, you know, we then worry about the coral reef because all of those ships travel through the Great Barrier Reef. All of these things are unsustainable. You know, an eight-year-old kid will tell you that that doesn't make good economic sense. It might make good economic sense once, but that's it. It's over. You've used the resource. You've abused the country. It's over. We have to do stuff that we're going to be able to do forever. And we owe it to the forest. We owe it to Mother Earth. And if people are going to truly consult with Aboriginal people, they will find that the way our people manage that forest was virtually uh, bushfire free, not fire free, but wildfire free, bushfire free. Our people probably didn't even have a word. I've never found one which talked about dangerous fire. All the words are friendly because it was a friend. We used fire as a friend. We knew it was going to be bad here. Um, we'd actually been training for it. But when the fire got around Can River, it really got up. You know, the, they were the worst conditions. And this great column um, of hot air, flame, ash, um, and stuff that had been ripped up off the ground created this thermal cloud and what can happen with them is if the temperature changes or there's a wind change, they can collapse. So that column of air collapsed on Malakuta. That was burnt January the 1st. This was burnt January the 12th. Even though it was so violent in Malakuta, it took a fortnight to get here. And, and it was still as hot here on February the 12th uh, because the fighters kept switching around through all this bush. Um, felt like I was chasing us, you know, you'd fight it over there one day, you'd fight it here the next day, down there, and then you'd be back here five days later fight it again. It was incredible. I remember being up here um, and watching this one go and thinking, I, I can't imagine ever being able to look at the farm the same way again. Um, <clears throat> when this came down, it was like thunder. Um, and that, that happened for five weeks. I, I wasn't always able to stay on the farm. I, I was fighting fires at Gypsy Point and over in the backwater upstream and um, but every night you'd hear this boom one of these big things would be coming down you know burnt off at the stump gone and uh, it was so depressing 
um, it just went on and on and on. And I was here on my own. Um, sometimes my neighbours were here, um, sometimes not. Um, we all fought the fires together when we could. Uh, but the, the presence of the fire over those five weeks was, um, it just started to um, dwell on you and hearing these things coming down every night. And there were really special trees that were lost, special trees for the culture. And um, it just started to weigh you down. Um, then these young people turned up, you know, they were, we hadn't been able to work on the farm during the fires and they came back to work and um, they picked me up, said, come on, we're getting stuck into it. And um, they didn't just rejuvenate the shed or the paddocks or the harvest, they rejuvenated me. Um, I'll never forget it. No, I was lucky. It was hot in here. Bloody hot. This is a really important um, site for us, for you and people. It has been used as a ceremonial ground for a long time. We're not sure how long, but we've got a Kulamon in the tree over here and another one on the other side of the same tree, uh, which is very old. Once again, we don't know how old. We've got the remains of an old stone arrangement here, which we have repaired um, in accordance with the law from Uncle Max. And uh, this Buna here, this dance ground Buna, uh, is still in use by Yuan people. And um, there are other Aboriginal clans who come um, and join in uh, from time to time. Uh, it's only in the last two years that we've done that, but we're reviving the old culture on this site. and. These trees are grey box, they're quite old, um, and it's indicative of the Buna that there'd be no trees in the centre. And so it's an important site for us, and I'm really, really glad to have it here um, so that uh, you and people can come down and practice culture um, on the old site. Um, becomes a really important part of farm life. This whole farm is about care. Everything we do, we talk about. We use as much language, human language as we can in, in that care. Um, we study our language, we, we study our culture because we'll, we find a lot of answers there. And I'm really fortunate to have um, Terry and Dowie and James um, and people like that here, and, and Chris, who's non-Aboriginal, but um, is um, really um, conscientious about sustainability. And so that's what we talk about all the time. If we do this, you know, we're repairing a road. If we do this, what does it mean? You know, uh, what does it mean for the country? You know, can we do it in another way? And we're, we're doing that sort of stuff all the time. We've hardly used any new timber here. We've built a lot of stuff. It's all old recycled fence posts. And um, uh, we're very proud. It takes us a lot longer. Um, and we're very fortunate that um, the Book Dark Emu has gone as well as it has because the proceeds from that allow us to be a bit um, uh, uh, generous with the way we, we do things. But you know, it's a wonderful thing for us all to be able to do that because, you know, I'm 72. Um, you know, I'm not going to be doing this for a lot longer, but I can do it at the moment. 
and we can train up here, we can train up large numbers of Aboriginal people uh, to take part in their environment and to care. And not, you know, Aboriginal people have had the guts kicked out of their culture and themselves. And I can give you vivid uh, examples of that uh, still happening in our communities today at Eden and Canru and Orbos. Um, but we're, tr we're fighting back. We're, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about the deficit. In Australian society and education, it's often said that Aboriginal people lost this and lost that, lost their language, lost their culture, lost their lives, uh, lost their way. Um, but it's all negative talk. We need to be uh, talking instead about what we've found, what, where we're going, not what happened to us in the past, but where we're going now and how we intend to flourish. Uh, so I don't talk about language loss. You know, I'm deeply involved in language. I don't talk about language lost. I talk about language found. Um, you know, it's obvious if you look at our word lists now and what, what the old people know about language, it's obvious that there are many things missing. Um, there are several birds here. I would love to have their language name, but I don't. But we will get them and we'll get them in consultation with our elders, not with linguists but with elders and we'll sit around and say, now this bird is part of our life and we don't know what to call it in our language. What are we gonna do? So we'll probably borrow from our neighbors if they have that word. And if not, we'll find the word. Because we're, we've invented words for mobile phones, yana laka, walk and talk. You know, it's not impossible to find a new word um, but I don't, you know, so that, that's the way I'd like us to look at it. And that's the way we do look at it here because we've got language books all over the house. At lunchtime, we spread them out on the table. We argue the point here and argue the point there. Um, you know, we found a new salad vegetable the other day. We've got no idea what it is. We don't even know its botanical name. We don't think it has a botanical name, um, but we're going to have to find a language name for it. So. You know, we'll have some decent old arguments in here about what's the best way to describe this plant because all Australians will end up eating it. It looks gorgeous on the plate and it, it's a, a beautiful flavour. It is our responsibility to find that word. People working on the farm who are also very keen on languages and... Uh, uh, so we can we can search for names like that, and um, you know we it's just a huge bonus for the farm uh, to have people so immersed in their culture, and we encourage them to do that. Um, you know we've got people studying here at the moment, and we pay them to study, um, and we're fortunate to be able to have those resources. Um, but it's just a, a joy to have people learning plants, learning language uh, while at work because it informs the work and it stimulates the work and makes, gives the work relevance. Uh, you know, I, it's impossible to tell you how much it means because for me, um, if, if this was just farming, I'd... I'd you know, I've done farming before, it's hard work, uh, and I'd lose interest, but with these younger people here and their dedication to language and culture and hard work, um, it, it's an inspiration to me. So all of what we do here, we try to make sure it's a step forward in Australian history, not a step back. and. So it's important for us to involve non-Aboriginal people of goodwill, and they're not hard to find, but often they do need a lot of education, and we try and supply that education. Um, but everything we do here has a purpose. There's not a day when we don't sit down at lunchtime and talk about culture. 
and after work. And then on, on our weekends, we go and visit a site um, because that's, you know, how strongly we feel about the culture. And for the, not for our sakes, but for Australia's sake and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and for the country itself. For Mother Earth, this beautiful old girl, you know, who now, you know, seven months ago had um, fire and then in the last fortnight, two floods and now, burn, sea eagle comes flying by us because that's the pattern. That's the pattern of this country. Hello and welcome back. I hope you all really enjoyed that video as much as we um, enjoyed being on the farm with Bruce. It was really um, quite an amazing experience, a, really a, a kind of life-changing experience in many ways. Now I've got the very great pleasure to introduce our discussant, Tyson Junkerporter, author, academic, educator, Indigenous thinker, maker of traditional wood carvings, arts critic, researcher, poet, and member of the Appalach clan from far northern Queensland with numerous other community and cultural links. Like Bruce's work and teachings, Tyson's most recent book, Sand Talk, which uh, you can see behind me here, is at once a journey into indigenous storytelling and ontologies, and at the same time, uh, a prescient and beautifully got, written guide for thinking about how we might live and be in a COVID world. It's playfully, but at the same time, deadly serious subtitle, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World, gives you a sense of why Tyson is also particularly well placed to speak at a conference about scale and also to be a discussant um, for Bruce Pascoe. Now, I'm just wondering, uh, an, another person has joined us. Um, perhaps they can unmute themselves and sh um, show themselves on video. I think it's a North Korean hacker. <laughs> Do you think it, North Korea could yeah. be? Yeah, and there's just going to be a apologies bunch of to any North Koreans who are actually joining us tonight. Yeah. Um, and video, can that person also show themselves on on video? Possibly. <laughs> I kick them out. This is great. This is live. This is live coming at you from from Australia. We're not quite sure who host 500 is. Are yeah. you are you going to do you want to show yourself host 500 or should we just um, go to I think, questions? I think kick them out and just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so Tyson, yeah, um, <laughs> right. I think one of one of the the uh, the the I think themes that I guess runs through Bruce's work and, and also your work is, aha, here we hey. are. And he, <laughs> here's North our surprise Korea. visitor, Bruce Pascoe, welcome. The opposite welcome. of North Korea. And, <laughs> and uh, the opposite <laughs> of North Korea, yeah. Uh, Tyson was suggesting that you were Zoom bobbing us from North Korea, but in fact, Bruce is coming to us from uh, just near Malakuta. Um, so wonderful to have you here, Bruce. Do you want to test your mic? How Thanks we? Very much. Um, oh, great! We can hear I've you. Been helping, I've been helping Donald Trump with his campaign. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. Oh, great! <laughs> well, it's so fabulous to have you, you and and Tyson with us um, in the room, and and um, you know, I'm feeling like um, I should really just turn my myself off at this point. <laughs> but um, so. 
Tyson, do you do you want to kind of kick things off and and perhaps um, ask Bruce a question? Let's turn the tables on you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so Bruce, I guess we're we're talking about scale here um, as the theme. Um, from my in analysis, from indigenous standpoint, um, I see scale as an imperative of civilization. I see scale as a um, as a self-terminating algorithm um, that civilization is running on. You know, um, it originates in a series of multipolar traps, giving rise to a system of perverse incentives uh, that that. Um, demands eternal and infinite growth um now you 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 often talk about the what of you know regenerative indigenous systems um and economies um but yeah i would i would like to hear you talk about the how uh what are the processes and models of those things um how do they work because I, I see a lot in that video there um beyond uh, what you're just saying. There are, there are very big processes and protocols going on uh, with language recovery and recovery of the land. And I see that same pattern. Um, yeah, so I guess a bit of a free range yarn around that side of things would be wonderful. Well, I think um, um, growth has become a uh, thing in the Western world and, and, and the Eastern world to that, for that matter um, for the benefit of um, industrial complexes and um, it, it assumes that we just have to have bigger and bigger markets, uh, more and more uh, expenditure, more and more consumption. Um, and I don't think the world has ever uh, uh, decided that that assumption was part of the world's life. It's just a modern aberration of greed. Um, but it, the, the only way you can have ever-expanding growth is if you have ever-expanding population, and as well as greed and um, you know, false demand. Um, but if we have an ever expanding population, we're going to kill ourselves. So we have to rein that in, but we also have to rein in our demand. And also when you, when you want production at that level, you then tend to refine and refine the production, but it, it is usually at the expense of the earth, one way or the other, either at the expense of the earth or our psychology. So the old Aboriginal system, um, as we're noticing on the farm at the moment, was very complex and you couldn't decide to harvest one thing only. You know, the patch where you wanted to harvest food contained many plants or many animals and you, you had to accept the whole lot. Um, you couldn't say, I just want kangaroo grass because amongst the kangaroo grass, there was also mamaj and nala. There was spear grass, there were orchids, there were mosses. You know, it's a complex system. And if you can't deal with complexity, you can't uh, deal with the earth. Mm. And what humans have been trying to do is to simplify everything to monocultures of one kind or another. We have yeah. to accept complexity and we have to accept the fact that um, it might be difficult that we can't simplify the earth away. Those monocultures are arguably in place to serve the interests of hierarchies. Uh, I noticed that a lot of your, uh, you know, collective efforts at, um, at regeneration on the land and with language and everything else there, uh, these seem to follow more of a decentralized uh, model. So you're not putting yourself at the as the boss in the center of things. Um, and, you know, the efforts are quite collective. You don't have a, an expert uh, linguist who's there 
you know, designing a curriculum and teaching everybody the language. It's a collective effort together, many minds, many stories, aggregating and um, in complexity, similar to the patterns mm. that you're, you just described in the landscape. Um, so what can people learn, you know, for their organizational systems, you know, uh, from these very decentralized, very indigenous models of being and knowing and, uh, and growing? Yeah, I think um, we have to listen to the earth as well as people. And if we accept that all our direction is going to come from government, uh, then we've centralised ourselves. Um, accepting that government will be able to decide our agricultural, economic and social future is a kind of totalitarianism, which we're supposed to um, deride, um, but we're very totalitarian in the world at the moment, and we should diversify and become more complex. Um, you know, the New Zealand um, political system is more or less designed so that no party will ever have a majority. Um, you know, Jacinda Ardern got a majority um, in defiance of the policy because she's such a bloody good prime minister. Um, but that's a fluke. Um, in Australia, we always um, elect people who will promise a reduction in our taxes. We don't um, vote for people who will promise us a better environment <clears throat> or promise us that we will still be here in 2080. Uh, we will go for a 1.5% reduction in our income tax um, delayed by five years. So that outside the realm of the government that we're electing, you know, Australians have voted, have voted through the hip pocket ever since mm. I can remember. Uh, mm. No election has been decided on philosophy uh, or hope or generosity. It's always been selfish. Mm. Well, like that's, um, happening. that's a representative democracy uh, system we're looking at there. There are a lot of people who are working to recover more kind of indigenous models um, of governance. Um, so one of the problems though with collective uh, governance as, as we have always done it here, uh, when they're trying to design, redesign those systems now, uh, one of the problems is what they call multipolar traps. Uh, multipolar traps are basically you know, the problem of when everybody owns everything collectively, all you need is one idiot, one idiot to start um, doing the wrong thing in there or taking more than he needs to get an unfair advantage. And then suddenly everybody has to start doing it and becoming bad actors in that system. Um, but in our traditional cultures, there have always been um, uh, systems of checks and balances uh, to limit that behavior. Um, yeah, can you speak to that? Yeah, well, in the old um, system, um, all power uh, never resided in the one being, either man or woman. Um, a number of people had control of a particular part of the story or the law, um, but that, could, that law could not be executed without the permission of all the others. So mm. it is like a very complex Senate and um, you might get through the men's section of that Senate and then you would be confronted by the women's section. So what it produced was an incredibly conservative government. And you know we've, we've learned to hate conservatism because it led us into the Vietnam War, World Wars I and II, Korea, all of those things. So we now think of conservatism as a, an excuse for miners to make billions out of the Commonwealth. Um, but in fact, um, the Aboriginal version of conservatism was just uh, respect for Mother Earth. Um, and you say that, and I know that people will uh, grimace and um, you know look look away because 
as soon as you mention love in any political situation, you, you classify yourself as a general idiot. But love of Mother Earth is really the fundament of um, Aboriginal law. Mm. And, and there was all, there away have always it. been very firm. There have always been very firm boundary protocols around each um, Indigenous territory. Um, however, those territories were also have traditionally been engaged in a lot of exchange and trade right across the continent and even beyond the continent. Um, how how did that? Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, so it's a, it's a remarkable balance of of maintaining the sovereignty of a territory while at the same time remaining in a kind of dynamic balance with a lot of other territories with their own interests. How did we manage that? Well, I think it, it's managed because it, um, ego was extracted from the equation. Um, you couldn't lust after someone else's land because the, the central part of the law was saying to us that um, we humans are nothing. We are no better uh, than the bandicoot or the fly or the flea or the tick. You know, that is who we are. They're, they're also our ancestors. Um, so we can't condemn any of them because you know, the likelihood is we'll, we'll become one of them. Um, so humility is embedded in the, in the system. And we're taught that all of, all of our respect goes to the earth. Uh, the, the earth is central. Uh, we don't govern the earth. We don't even govern a country. We don't even govern our own um, lands because that is a collective. The land, whatever it is, governs us. And she um, tells us what to do. And if we look very closely at it, at the land, at the animals, at the birds, at the plants, at the insects, we will learn what needs to be done. But Europeans, um, and, and to a certain extent, um, Asian countries have turned their back on the land um, because they wanted to become God. Because the, the European God is a human. The Aboriginal God is the earth itself, mm. the animals. A human never appears as a God. Well, civilizations began in what was known as the Fertile Crescent, um, and which is now mostly desert, which is the inevitable um, uh, end point, end game of these civilizations, and particularly uh, as a civilization is defined by its growth-based imperative that we mentioned earlier. I would like to suggest an alternative and hear, to you, hear you speak to that, uh, the ceremony that you're talking about, you know, you re you're recovering those ceremonies in place. And I know you can't give details about that, um, but so you're involved in in increase ceremonies at the same time as you're doing this uh, land regeneration. And I would like to offer a provocation, um, offering the idea of increase as an alternative to the model of growth, the indigenous idea of increase, uh, which is not about increasing the size of the system but by increasing the connections, um, the combinations, the relationships within that system. So in a way, it's a kind of growth into the micro rather than a growth into the macro. Um, what, what, what would you think about the idea of offering uh, the idea of indigenous uh, increase, you know, in the way we think of about it in terms of increase ceremonies? Offering that as a model, as an alternative uh, to growth-based economic paradigms. Um, it's a really interesting question, and as you say, um, when we when we say increase, we're not talking about a, a, a bigger yield for more people. We're talking about um, continuance, mm. um, continuance of of the system and that our only contribution to it is care, um, care for the earth. So if we could suggest to 
the governors of the world, that we become absolutely involved in the care of the world rather than the care of ourselves, then um, we would have done something um, really important for the world. Um, but if you, if you continue to elect or allow a system to elect a Donald Trump um, or in fact, a Scott Morrison or um, any, any leader, you know, be it Green or uh, Labor, who doesn't see the earth as central um, to the health of the world, then, um, uh, then we've failed. So we, we, have to, um, we have to change the way we think about the world. And, and someone popped up a question there before about education. I believe it does. I think um, I would like to see a period in the earth where we were governed by eight-year-old children because my experience of eight-year-old kids is you say to them, um, look, there's a hundred sandwiches, a hundred apples and a um, hundred fish. How are they divide? And there's a hundred people. How do you divide up the, you know, the apple sandwiches and fish? And the eight-year-old will say, well, everyone gets one. You know, it's simple. It's a mathematical principle. Um, the more sophisticated 17-year-olds say, well, who grew the apples? Where did the fish come from? You know, the, the whole thing is turned on its head. Um, it's not about fairness anymore. It's about wealth. And um, we, we need to go back to the eight-year-old mentality of fairness. And once again, it will seem ludicrous to most of the world. Um, but I think our eight-year-old child, and I've had two of them, uh, I've got four grandchildren, and the eight-year-old child is a better arbiter of the world than anyone um, who claims to be an adult. We've, we've actually got um, quite a few questions from the audience, if we can perhaps um, turn, turn to them. So one, one of those, I guess, is, a, is around how we scale the understanding of the importance of sustainability to those members of the public who feel that topic doesn't speak, speak to them. How can we make the general public feel that sustainability is intrinsic to their, to their livelihood and well-being? It's, a bit, it's a, just a small question. <laughs> well, I think um, in the initial instance, we talk to them in their own language. We talk to them about um, economic mathematics and we, we, we show them that the trajectory that we're on is going to destroy us. And, you know, most, most capitalists understand the world destruction. And um, I think we need to put a real uh, lot of work into uh, educating our business leaders that um, uh, we ultimately going to destroy ourselves. And business leaders are noticing this because look at the way they've walked away from coal. Even though our governments try to boost coal um, and argue for it um, because of vested interests and things like that, business leaders are walking away from it because they can see there's no future in it. So there's a, a divide between the intelligence of the business leaders, not just their intelligence, but their morality and the morality of big capital because big capital wants to survive and what we need to do is talk to big capital and say, we, we will allow you to survive. We, the people, will allow you to survive. But these are now the conditions. The conditions are um, ever and ever greater wealth. Um, one of the other conditions will be that everyone in Africa will be fed now. Um, no one in Africa will be given poisoned Australian or Chinese milk. Now, these are basic moral principles. That's where the eight-year-old comes into it. Because you say to the eight-year-old, will we send those Afri starving Africans poisoned milk? And the eight-year-old will say, of course not. Whereas the 32-year-old uh, business executive in one of the big banks 
or so. It's a, it sounds like a good deal. I think that's uh, that's probably a really nice note to wrap up on. Um, I'm sorry, our time has gone so quickly. We actually have quite a few more questions, but um, I'm aware that we're going to be finishing this session very soon. Um, so thank you so much, Bruce, um, for joining us from Malakuda and Tyson for, for joining um, us from Melbourne. Uh, it's been a real treat to have the two of you here on the screen um, together. Um, thank you so much. And um, everyone, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we now have some salon, a number of salon sessions that I know many of you have signed up for. Um, and uh, we, we later on have a mingle as well. So I might see some of you there. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow at the conference. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, see you Bruce. later, brother.